Hello, my friends, hello, and welcome once again to Stately Vaughn Manor, where Roger and I have returned to talk about some physical books. Recently, Gareth Howells over on his channel, Books, Songs, and Other Magic, he made a video where he was talking about ebooks versus paper books, that eternal debate uh, here on BookTube. And Gareth is not a fan of ebooks. He loves physical books, and he was talking about why. And in this video, most of the video actually was all about these books, these specific books that Gareth loves, these specific physical books. Because the way he sees it, when he reads a book, first of all, he enjoys the experience of reading a physical book over uh, reading an e-reader, but also he develops a relationship with the book itself, by which I think he means that he develops an affection for the physical object. It, it, it becomes something that is important to him, the, this specific object, which is the book that he is reading or has read. And it means something to him, that aspect of it. So that's something that I understand, actually. Because there are a lot of books that I feel the same way about, where there's something about this specific copy of this specific book that I have an affection for. This particular object, as an object, means something to me because it has, at the very least, sentimental value. It's something that has been important in my life. And I, there are a lot of books that I feel that way about. And Gareth went through a bunch of them in his video, and I thought, you know what? I don't have anything against the technology of e-reading. I actually think e-reading and e-readers are a good thing. If nothing else, they make a lot of books accessible to people who might otherwise not be able to either find these books as physical copies or perhaps because of eyesight or some other physical issue, they wouldn't be able to read them without an e-reader. E-readers, I think, are actually pretty important, you know, for, the, for a lot of us who are readers. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, during this video. But it has to be said that there are a lot of physical books that mean an awful lot to me just as a reader and as a person who has been reading my whole life. So I'm going to do what Gareth did, and I'm going to talk about some specific books that mean a lot to me. And of course, I'm going to start with this specific book, which I've held up a dozen times at least on this channel, which is, of course, Dracula, because this copy of Dracula, this edition of Dracula, this is the version of Dracula that I read. And not only that, it is the first adult book that I ever read, the first book that wasn't aimed directly at children. And I read this when I was a kid, and I was too young to really understand everything that was going on in this book. But I loved it. I loved it just the same. And of course, I've read this book a gazillion times since, and I've read it in many different editions. But this particular mass market copy of this book is the one that means the most to me. And as an object, I have great affection for it. This cover in particular, in particular just haunted my dreams when I was a little kid. It, what a great cover this Signet edition has. And I, I, I remember just, it was just so, you know, it's Dracula, right? So it's a vampire. And I, ever since I was born, I loved monsters and horror. I've always had that fascination and that love for, you know, horrors and monsters. So of course I'm going to want to read Dracula. I remember just opening to this first chapter in 
immediately coming across stuff that, you know, I didn't know what the heck they were talking about because there was, Jonathan Harker was talking about countries and places that I had never heard of. And, but it was all, it was all fascinating. And I loved it. And I love this particular copy of this particular book. So there you go. Dracula has to start with that. But there have been a number of paperback, mass market paperback classics that I've read over the years that I've developed an affection for the physical copy itself. Because for years, that's how I read classic books like Charles Dickens, this particular copy of David Copperfield. This is the first and only time that I've read this book. I've only read this book once, I believe. And I really, really enjoyed it. I remember specifically reading this specific copy of this book, and it did exactly what a work of fiction is supposed to do. It kind of sweeps you away into this other time and place where I became very involved in David Copperfield's world and very concerned about David Copperfield and all of his trials and tribulations. Uh, it was, it's a wonderful story and I loved it. And because of that, because I read this particular copy, I have an affection for this particular object. I could say that about dozens of physical copies of classics that I haven't, you know, been able to get rid of over the years just because of the feeling and the experience that I had when I first read them in this particular format. And that goes for a lot of books, like the Iliad, for example. This is the E.V. Rue translation. I've actually got a couple copies of this. This one was lost for a long time until I stumbled upon it recently. In <laughs> It was in a, a comic book long box where I had a bunch of comic books and I had some other books stuffed in front of the comics. And I've got a lot of boxes like that. I've got a lot of books lost amongst the comics just because of that. And this was there. And I'm like, I thought I had lost this years ago. But this was my first experience with Homer. And it was this translation, the E.V. Rue translation, his prose translation, which I recommend to anybody who's never read Homer before. It's just an extremely readable, entertaining prose translation of the Iliad. And like I said, this was my introduction to Homer. So of course that's important to me. But there are a bunch of other books also in the mass market format that are very important to me. This set of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. This is how I've always read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Yes, I've got a couple really nice editions over here on the bookshelf of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But these editions, as beautiful as they are, and one of them has illustrations by Tolkien himself, so that's really the one I should read the next time I read Lord of the Rings. But I just love this particular set. And with this, there is a bit of nostalgia in there. And that's, what, you know, I, I won't say that there isn't, but I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with nostalgia as a thing. I mean, I know that it's something that has been turned into a product to be sold, especially for those who, especially for like Disney, who does that, you know, just as a regular thing, selling nostalgia. But as, it, as a thing itself, I don't think it's a bad thing. And it certainly plays a part in why I love these particular editions with these particular covers. Uh, I just love them. I love this set of books. They're great. They're kind of falling apart now, some of them, like The Hobbit has seen better days. But I do love this set of books. This, this edition of The Lord of the Rings in particular. There are other books like that. Let's talk a little bit about my favorite writer of all time. Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan. I have a couple books 
here that I have a great affection for, like this beat up, and this one's beat to hell. It was beat up when I got it. This is Cull, the fabulous warrior king. He's fabulous. He was fabulous, Cull. But this is the this is the edition that I first read the Cull stories in. And I just found it terribly interesting because here was a character like Conan, but different. He had a different personality. And I read this at a time when I didn't really know too much of the backstory of Cull other than what was in the introduction by Andrew Offit. So that's all I knew about Cull is what was in the introduction and, and the stories in this book. But I, re I remember specifically reading this copy of the Cull stories and I just loved them because I love this writer and I feel the same way about this book. This is Wolf's Head, which has a bunch of horror stories that Robert E. Howard wrote for Weird Tales, which I knew nothing about at the point that I read this. When I read this, I had read Almuric, which was a science fiction kind of fantasy novel that Robert E. Howard wrote. That's actually the first Robert E. Howard book that I read. Then I had read some Conan in the El Sprague de Camp Ace version, where his stories were all mixed up with El Sprague de Camp stories. But this is the first time in this copy that I read any of Robert E. Howard's horror fiction. And there are some great stories in here. Wolf's Head, of course, The Valley of the Worm, The Black Stone is in here, uh, The House of Erebu. Cool stuff. And this is the first time I read any of it. Of course, there is my Arkham House edition of Lovecraft, which was my first... It wasn't my introduction to Lovecraft, but it's the first time I read all of Lovecraft was in this set of books from Arkham House. This is the original edition that was uh, edited by S.T. Joshi. This particular copy has an introduction by T.E.D. Klein, who I'll be talking about in a minute. So of course, I'm a huge Lovecraft fan and have been for years. So this set of books, this four volume set, it means an awful lot to me. And I remember just being blown away by how many different kinds of stories Lovecraft wrote. Fantasy, horror, uh, science fiction even. I was, I was quite surprised. And the, I, the font of the titles alone, I just, every time I, I open one of these books up, it just takes me back. Again, there's that nostalgia factor, but I just do love those books. And of course, I have to mention Edgar Rice Burroughs and these particular copies of A Princess of Mars, A Gods of Mars, and The Warlord of Mars. These two books have the first three books, which are essentially a trilogy. And it, it's, it's these stories in these particular books that got me interested fascinated really in Edgar Rice Burroughs as a writer and of course after I read the Mars books I read all the Tarzan books and the Pluster books and everything else I could find by Edgar Rice Burroughs and back in the day there was a there was a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs because he, he was very popular in the 60s and the 70s and into the early 80s so there were plenty of Burroughs around. You can still get Burroughs pretty easily on eBay if you're interested in this writer. But these are the very copies that I remember reading. And of course, the artist is Frank Frazetta, who did the illustrations and the covers. You can't get a better artist than Frazetta to illustrate Burroughs. And there's something about these books, again, as physical objects. I will never, ever, ever get rid of them because they're important to me. And there are a lot of books like that, just randomly, just as a, a random example, because I, there are more books than I could even mention that I feel this way about. Let's talk about The Killer Thing. The Killer Thing by Kate Wilhelm. The Killer Thing by Kate Wilhelm. There's Kate Wilhelm there. 
And this is a terrible, terrible cover for this book club edition of The Killer Thing. But this is a fantastic book. It's just a great book about a soldier who's been trained to be a soldier, to be a killer. And he's up against a killer robot. And he has to battle this killer thing. And it was it's just a great book. It's, as far as I know, this is one of those books that's not available as an ebook. Last time I looked anyway, at least not in the States the last time I looked. But if you ever find it in any format, read it. It's pretty damn good. I have a paperback copy of this too, but if, but it's this copy that lingers in my memory <laughs> with this goofy cover for the killer thing. What a great book. It's This is one of my favorite books, actually, The Killer Thing. I just love it. I love it. Sorry, I had a cutaway there. Somebody came to the door. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Physical books that I love. This is a fun one. This is actually a reference book. And this is the most important reference book that's ever been published. Well, it's one of the most important reference books that ever been, that's ever been published, and that's Creature Features by Paul Stanley. Now, if you grew up in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, like I did, when I was growing up, there was a late night show called Creature Features where Paul Stanley, the host of this show, would show really terrible horror movies. They were usually, sometimes they were good, but usually they were pretty terrible. And I loved it. And, you know, my mission every Saturday night was to watch the, what did I watch? It was like the love boat was on and I had to suffer through that. Then the Twilight Zone on, was on, that was great. And then after the Twilight Zone came Creature Features. Every Saturday I watched Creature Features and just attempted to stay awake the whole movie. But Paul Stanley wrote, the host of Creature Re Features, wrote Creature Features, the movie guide. And this, this was, he wrote several versions of this. And this one was published in 2000 or 2001. Let me double check. Yeah, this particular edition was published in 2000. And it has, you know, little capsule reviews. But the review, they are reviews by John Stanley, who knew a hell of a lot about horror movies because he had sat through so many of them. And this book has these little reviews and information on all of these 20th century horror, horror movies, many of which you probably will not hear of unless you have this book. I'm sure many of the films in this book have just disappeared, you know, and you'd have a hard time finding a lot of them. But it is, it's wonderful, this book. I can't praise this enough. If you're a, if you're a fan of classic science fiction, fantasy, and horror movies, this is essential. You should jump on eBay and get this if you don't have it already and you are interested in those because it's just, it's got everything from the 20th century. It's fantastic. So that I love. Another writer I discovered when I was younger who hasn't written much, but left a huge impression on me, was the, was the writer I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, T.E.D. Klein, and this is Dark God. This is the first edition of this book. This is four novellas, or novelettes, whatever you want to call them, four longish short stories. And I, they're sort of Lovecraftian, and they just kind of blew me away when I read them because they were different from anything else I had read up to that point in horror. And when, the, when this book came out, there was a lot of horror being published. This was in the 1980s. What year was this? This is uh, 85. Okay, this, this book came out in 1985. And so there was a deluge of horror at the time, which you know, if you know anything about the paperbacks from hell phenomena, For a long time, this book was out of print. It's back in print now, so you can read it. But these are stories of just extremely high quality. T.E.D. Klein 
he's a great writer who didn't who doesn't particularly like to write so he doesn't write much but when he does he writes some really good stuff and he was the editor of twilight zone magazine for a long time which has become kind of a legendary magazine now and this is just an amazing book i, I can't praise this enough and this particular copy it's kind of battered now kind of torn up now because it's old and it's been passed around a little bit to friends and things and but I love it. Dark Gods, T.E.D. Klein. It's one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites in horror is Demons by Daylight by Ramsey Campbell. Ramsey Campbell, an author I like an awful lot. And I've got a couple of editions of this. This is the first edition. This is the one that was published by Arkham House. And then this is either an early or the first paperback edition of Demons by Daylight in paperback. I love the paperback cover. That's just awesome. Again, this was this was late 70s. Was it 1970 when this was published? 1973. But an interesting thing about Demons by Daylight, I think this is not in print right now. Last time I checked, this wasn't in print as a physical book. As far as I know, you can still get this as an ebook. Let me know if I'm wrong. I'd be interested if there's a physical copy of this out nowadays, but for the longest time, at least, there hasn't been. And an interesting thing is because this is a very influential collection of short stories, and the contents are just a little bit different in every edition. You've got the original edition, which has a few stories in the contents that are not in this. But this has some stories that are not in this. And that might have been due to rights issues. I don't know, that's just what I'm assuming. There, the last time I checked my ebook version of it, I do have an ebook version of it, it has stories that aren't in these either. So the contents just kept changing in this. It would be nice if a new edition came out that has all of the stories that appeared in all of the different editions. As it is, I'm glad I have all of the editions just because this is, in horror, a pretty important book. And Ramsey Campbell's a pretty important writer. And I'm not a huge collector when it comes to books. But because I really like the writer and I just find this book tremendously interesting as a book. I have an affection for the different versions that I have, including these two fantastic print versions. Uh, one book I have to mention is this one. This is Algernon Blackwood. This is the library, the Centipede Press Library of Weird Fiction. This is from a series of books that S.T. Joshi edited for Centipede Press. Now, like everything that's published by Centipede Press, this almost immediately became collectible. This is an important volume because this is a nice hardcover edition of Algernon Blackwood, of a lot of his horror stories. All of his major horror stories are in here. This is an edition of his stories in hardcover that, and there's just not many of those out there, if any, right now. And so this is an edition that is very sought after. I actually got an offer on this one time for, I think he was offering $900 to buy this off me. Somebody was. And I turned it down. Because I, I can't part with this. I, I mean, look at the, how could you part with Algernon Blackwood? No, not for $900. Not for $9,000, I wouldn't get rid of this. Because I have a tremendous affection for this book. Because it's a wonderful book. This is a wonderful author. And, you know, it's just, it's just fantastic. And it's kind of unique. Like I said, I would like it if some publisher would publish a big, fat volume of Algernon Blackwood in a hardcover edition, but nobody seems to be doing that. You could probably, I'm sure you can get print on demand paperbacks and things of Algernon Blackwood, 
but not of this quality, I'm sure. Again, if you have an e-reader, you won't have a physical book, but you can get everything Algernon Blackwood wrote for like a couple bucks, which is one of the important things about e-readers, uh, which you could say the same thing for this. This is the best ghost stories of M.R. James, and this was the edition that I first read M.R. James in. And it's just this old, old, old hardcover book. Who published this? This was published by the World Publishing Company. And it was published in 1944. No, this is the fourth printing. So this is from 1946. This is the best ghost stories of M.R. James. And if you, looking at the contents, it does have all of the best Ghost Stories of M.R. James. And this is the first time I read M.R. James. This is the volume that I read the stories in. I just reread M.R. James, but I read it in the Collected Ghost Stories Oxford edition. Maybe I should have read this one, even though it's not complete. Just because I love this particular edition so much, as an object, it means a lot to me. The same can be said. We're going to pull out Robert E. Howard again. For my favorite Robert E. Howard Conan story, which you could find in this book, this is The Hour of the Dragon. Now, for a while, Donald M. Grant, publisher, the publisher Donald M. Grant, was publishing Conan editions that looked like this, with just the very plain, you know, with the design, the very plain dust jacket. Um... But you open it up, and it's really cool. So we've got the Hour of the Dragon here. This edition is illustrated by Ezra Tucker. This was published in 1989. So this was one of the later ones that he published. I have a few of these. I don't have all of the ones that Grant published, but I got a few of them. And the artwork is just really, really cool. Here we have King Conan facing off against a giant ape. Any of you who have read this story, you know that particular scene. And then we've got Conan on the deck of a pirate ship there. There's Conan. I mean, it's just... I read this, and I probably got this... I probably got this in 90 or 91. This particular scene, I've never seen illustrated better than this. Again, if you've read this story, you know which scene this is. Uh, from the Hour of the Dragon, and I've never seen it look this good. Uh, this is just, that's just an amazing piece of artwork there. These Donald M. Grant editions were really nice, and this is my favorite Robert E. Howard story, and this is my favorite edition of the Hour of the Dragon. It's just magnificent, and I love it. I love it as an object, as a thing in this world. I love it. I got a couple more and then I'll shut up. But there's some other ones that I really should mention just because they, they're they so important to me. We've got the essential Ellison. My stepfather introduced me to this writer, Harlan Ellison. And this is just a fat book of his essential works. This is a 35-year retrospective. Later on, a newer edition of this came out, which I think was a 50-year. Am I right or am I wrong? I think there was a 50-year edition of this. Now, Harlan Ellison, no matter what you might think of him as a human being, and I know a lot of people had issues with Harlan Ellison, his, his talent was undeniable. I mean, if he was around, you could just ask him and he would tell you. His, his, talent, his talent was amazing. And he was a great writer of short fiction. And this book just has some great stuff. It has, it, there's, there's a lot of different things. There's memoirs in here, mostly stories. Uh, we have at least, we have a, an unpro, bleh, unproduced teleplay flintlocks in here. So there's just all kinds of cool stuff in here. If you're a fan of Harlan Ellison or if you're interested in Harlan Ellison, this is a wonderful book to have. And I've had this copy for years and years and years. This is not the edition my stepfather had, 
but I, I did buy this fairly young, I think, so that I would have my own copy of it. And yeah, it's, it's pretty important to me. This author is important to me. And this book is. It's just a magnificent book. And, thinking, and speaking of books that are important to me, when I think of BookTube, when I first started on BookTube, uh, I got a hold of a couple things that I love because they make me think about BookTube itself, which has been a very positive experience for me. I know this video is going on and on and on. But hey, there are a lot of books that I like, including this one. This is The Wolfman by Nicholas Pacero, which is just a werewolf novel. And the reason it's important to me is because this was possibly the first book I bought because I saw it reviewed on BookTube. And I saw it on a channel called Books of Blood. And Books of Blood is a channel that is retired now. You can still, all the videos are still up the last time I checked. I'll link it down below. Uh, the guy who did this, uh, who did these reviews, he loves horror. And he did a video called The Best Werewolf Novels or something, which was one of the first booktube videos that I saw, I believe. And he talked about this book and I thought, you know what, that sounds great, I'm going to get it. And it is a really good book. Uh, this was written by Nicholas Pacero. This was his only published novel because Nicholas Pacero was, uh, in, he was part of the New York Police Department and he died uh, on duty. He was killed on duty. So unfortunately, he never wrote any more books. He was going to make a series about this character in The Wolfman. Not, this has nothing to do with the film. And it's a shame he never got the chance to do it because it's, an, it's a very fun book. And because it is the first book that I bought, specifically because I watched it, I saw the guy on Books, and, on Books of Blood talk about it, it's important to me because it was before I ever got on BookTube myself, but it was kind of at the beginning of my BookTube experience. And then when I got on BookTube, this other thing came in the mail one day from a writer that I admire who wrote a werewolf novel called The Forsaken Boy, and that'd be Troy Tradeup, and he sent me this. Now, I am obsessed with the novel Frankenstein. It's one of my favorite novels. I could, I could read Frankenstein every year or in my life and still find it interesting. And he sent me this, and this is a big hardcover that has the original draft of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley in her own handwriting. These are from two notebooks where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. So this is the first draft, I believe, of Frankenstein in this book. And of course, I was staggered to get this as a gift and so i'm this i love it just because it was a gift from troy trade up but also because it's just so cool and it was a fascinating book to read it took a while you know when you don't read somebody's handwriting if you've never read somebody's handwriting before it can be a little hard to decipher at first and this was an experience that I used to have a lot when, you know, people used to write letters and things. Now I don't think anybody even knows how to write in handwriting. I think everybody prints everything now. But there was a time when, you know, if you wrote a letter or a manuscript, it looked like this. And you would have to get this letter or manuscript or whatever and, and have to decipher it first and say, okay, you have to get used to this person's handwriting before you could really read it. And that, I had that experience, which I hadn't had in forever, reading this, where I had to get used to Mary Shelley's handwriting before I could decipher it. And it was, it was a really interesting experience. And this is just, you know, if you're a fan of this novel Frankenstein, this is, of course, incredible. 
Another thing I have to mention is this. This is a big collection of EC comic stories. And my step, this was another book from my stepfather that I did steal from him. And my brother and I read this book over and over and over again. And so it's important to me because for a lot of reasons. One, it is an artifact from my childhood. And this represents the first time I ever read EC horror comics or horror comic books of any kind was in this book. I was reading them when I was just a little child. And they're full of blood and gore and guts and all the other cool stuff that you would expect, including some incredibly adult, hard-hitting stories like this one. Uh, it was a wonderful book. And I read this over and over and over again when I was a kid, which, you know, is one of the reasons it's in the shape it's in, you know? This at one time had a dust jacket. That dust jacket didn't last, man. It didn't last, no. But there are a lot of reasons that I love this book. Only one more, and then I will shut up because I've literally been, gone on, been going on forever and knocking things over over here, and that would be this one. This is the landmark Herodotus. This is my favorite book of all time. This is my favorite book of all time, The Histories by Herodotus. And this is just a fantastic edition of The Histories. These landmark editions of ancient history are amazing because they have wonderful illustrations and photographs and because they have incredible maps all throughout. And one thing you need reading the histories, I think, are a lot of maps. You need a lot of maps to help navigate you because there are a lot of cities that are mentioned in this book that don't exist anymore. And it could be kind of hard to keep track of what happens where or what happens when. Everything is dated in here as well. And so it's just an excellent guide through, for getting through this book. The first time I read the histories was in just a cheap Barnes & Noble edition, which, you know, I have an affection for as well. But this was so much more informative and was such a better experience reading this edition. And this is beat, beat to hell, too. Because I've had this since 2007, I think, is when this came out, if I'm remembering right. And I've carried this everywhere. I've carried this to work. I've carried this literally everywhere because I've read it everywhere. I've read this book multiple times. And I will read it many more times. And I have a great affection for this exact copy of the book. So there you go. I'll shut up now. But that's, that's my video about the physical books that I love. And in saying all that, I do still think ebooks are pretty important. Because like I said, they can make so many books accessible that you wouldn't have an opportunity to read otherwise. And, you know, for some people, it's just the best way to read. So nothing against e-readers. I have nothing against e-readers. But for physical books, yeah, I love these. Okay, guys, I'll shut up now. I will catch you next time.